everybody. How are you? Tim Kermode here, CEO of power to be in a very silent place somewhere in Victoria, hidden, unknown location. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. Thanks for everyone for coming. I'm really excited about uh, this evening with, uh, with Ed and, and him to hear his story. Um, before we begin, I, I think it's most important to uh, acknowledge the lands that we're on. Um, each of us has a relationship with the natural environment, the land, the water, the earth, the habitat and the ecosystems. And land, uh, land acknowledgements provide us the opportunity to respect and recognize original inhabitants of the regions in which we live in. So as we're all here virtually, um, I just first of all like to make sure that we all take a minute to recognize the traditional lands and waterways that we are all on. At power to be we are super grateful to work and play on the traditional territories of the coast salish people thank you i want to first of all express some great thank you to our sponsor robinson's outdoor store um part of this is virtual tonight um but also gail and her team and aaron and matt are hosting their first i do believe in person evening back at their store i think in three years um so there, i think there's about 50 people down there watching here tonight so first of all thank you so much for sponsoring this event thank you for inviting people into your store and most importantly just thanks for our, our 12 i think 12 to 15 year i can't even remember how long it's been you know with this pandemic time has just flown by but to simply say uh i remember when uh, gail contacted me one day and, and asked if we could you know be interested in their support and apparently some other organization had turned down their offer which bad for them great for us um, and as a result of that we spent years together um, robinson providing gear and equipment for our participants to have safe place for them to play in camp and and also providing us with funds and resources i did a fashion show for them once it was a lot of fun probably the only fashion show i ever did and probably never do one again but gail thank you again for including me um, can't thank you guys enough for helping this out and I hope everybody down there can hear us and enjoy the evening tonight. Um, I also really wanna thank our team, um, our power to be team, our volunteers, our staff, our funders, our participants. Um, we're all here because of them. And uh, I, it always gives me great pleasure to host events like this where everyone benefits. And you know, it's, it hasn't been the greatest journey for the last two years, but I think it's been super inspirational. Our organization has found ways to stay connected to our participants and make them feel valued and supported in a time when everyone was feeling i think super isolated and while this was going on we were building what i refer to as a world-class health and wellness center out of prospect lake and we're this close to occupancy similar to climbing everest to get to that final 300 feet the hardest part is occupancy and so we're working hard to get into this space so that we can play in it um, we can grow in it and we can bring people back to where they belong, which is in nature. And uh, I'm really excited about um, getting there and the journey's been some challenges, but we've been working away quietly behind the scenes. So any of you ever want to come out for a visit, I ask you to please do so. Um, we'd love to show you around. It's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so why are we here tonight? Well, luckily we're here to meet a very inspiring human being. Um, Ed, as you know, um, is one of the most recognized mountaineers in the world. Um, he has climbed all, summited all 14 of the world's 8,000 meter peaks. He's been awarded for participating in two rescue missions on K2. He's the recipient of the historic Lowell Thomas Award by the Explorers Club for outstanding achievement in the field of mountaineering, joining a elite group of climbers, including Sir Edmund Hillary. He is an accomplished author, a highly sought out speaker on teamwork and perseverance, He's joining us today from Sun Valley, Idaho, from his home. I'd like to welcome the wonderful Ed Beasters. Ed, thanks for joining us tonight. Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I would have, uh, you know, first of all, you know, we've spent so much time figuring this virtual experience that I figured cost-wise I should have just flown you up here and we should have just done this in person. But needless to say, thanks for being here today. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to have, obviously, we have a few questions I'm going to share, and, and, and the audience is going to um, obviously ask some questions, too. So anyone in the audience who, who would like to have some questions, please put them on the chat, and I'll do my best to, to get them out there to you. You know, first of all, I, I read your book, No Shortcuts to the Top, and, and a few things I was hoping to speak to today was 
a part of the beginning of your life in, in mountaineering, um, some of the challenges and successes in, you know, in today's world too, I think, I know you've evolved from mountaineering and doing a variety of things from writing books to conducting expeditions in the Antarctic. So I, I, there's a variety of things we could talk about. We only have, oh my God, 40 minutes. I'd like to wish you could be here for hours, but we're going to go on a fishing trip and I'll find out more on that time. But uh, <laughs> simply say, um, thanks for your time. And I, I guess the first question is right off the dot. I know, you know, in reading your book that there was a book that, you know, really inspired you to get started. I just thought you could speak to the book itself and, and how it just, yeah, got you off the ground, ready to go. Yeah, you know, and I talk about this all the time. I was, uh, as a kid, I grew up in what I call the great mountaineering state of Illinois, you know, quote unquote. <laughs> but I was uh, trying to find adventure somehow. And so for me, that was reading books. And I read about the Arctic and Antarctic. I read endurance, you know, South Pole kind of things. And in the same section of the library, there were all these mountaineering books. And I happened upon uh, Annapurna. And so I read Annapurna. This was the expedition that took place in 1950. Uh, it was the first ascent of an 8,000 meter peak. And it just uh, flipped a switch. And I, after reading that book, I said, that's what I'm going to go do. I'm going to go climb some big mountains. And I was really realistic. I said, yeah, okay, first thing I have to do is get the heck out of Illinois, you know, right? Um, but I gave, I, I told myself, if I give myself 10 years and if I move myself somewhere where I can start climbing, uh, and so right out of high school, I moved to Seattle, uh, because I thought for me, that was kind of the hub of American Himalayan mountaineering because of the, the Cascades and Mount Rainier. And so I moved myself to Seattle and I went to college there and that was kind of the foot in the door. Um, you know, I started climbing on Rainier. I got a job as a guide on Rainier. Uh, I met some great mentors and teachers and eventually slowly um, worked my way up the ladder and found myself uh, on Everest 10 years after reading uh, that book. Wow. Did you think it was going to take 10 years? I, I gave myself 10 years. You know, it's that 10,000 hour rule. And, and I, yeah. I, I thought, <laughs> you know, if you want to do it right, it, it doesn't happen quickly. And I wanted to take the time and to be ready. And I thought, you know, step by step, day by day, slowly climbing the ladder, higher mountains, you know, just not jumping right to Everest, but climbing the ladder of higher peaks, you know, Denali and Aconcagua. And then I got to go to Russia and I, I felt myself progressing. You know, it's like I, I tell people a carpenter doesn't just, just pick up a hammer and build a house right? There's an apprenticeship program that you have to, and you kind of know when you're ready to take that next level. And it's all about being patient. And for me, it's all about the process. And I love just going out there. And I think if you embrace the the, the process, you're like, oh, I'll just take my time and I'll do it right. I was going to mention, you know, I was reading that when you're talking about rainy and guiding, like I used to be a kayak guide, nothing about mountaineering. It's not even close to the same. So I won't even compare the two, meaning yours is way better than ours. But just to simply say, I think though there's a club there and, and how hard it is to move your way up the ladder in mountaineering, particularly in the guiding world, because there's only so select few roles and, and opportunities. So like a couple of patients, how did you get through that whole guiding experience to get to that place where you could actually get the job that you wanted? Because I know it's hard to get there, especially in that industry. Yeah, you know, on Rainier, it was, um, in my day, it was an apprenticeship program where, uh, you know, the first year you're called a peon and, and not in a demeaning <laughs> way, but uh, it, it's like, you've got to work hard. And I, and I just thought to myself, I'm going to work hard, keep my mouth shut, listen, watch, learn, and, and show that I'm an asset to the team. And I think a few of the senior guides took note of that. And they're always looking for somebody to go work for them when you go to, you know, uh, adventures across the globe and you weren't going to get paid, but you got a free trip. And I said, I don't care. I'm going to go learn, gain experience, get a free trip. And for me, that was showing that was that I was willing to be a team member and work hard. And it, it paid off. It really paid off. I mean, I gained experience and I got to learn from these senior guides that who became my friends and my mentors. And eventually 
they're the ones that invited me on these bigger expeditions. Um, and I, I think that's just part of just showing that you're capable and, and willing to work hard um, because you love what you do. Well, speaking of mentors, um, you refer to Reinhold Messner as one of the most visionary mountaineers of all time. How did he inspire you to sort of go on this endeavor of 8,000? You know, what was sort of, yeah, his mentorship behind you to really take this to the next level and do what you've done? Well, you know, he was the first guy to think, um, you know, we can climb these 8,000 meter peaks without oxygen. I mean, that was the first step. And then when he and uh, Peter Habler climbed Everest 1978 without oxygen, that was physically and I mean, psychologically more than anything groundbreaking. So he, he, they, they broke that barrier that it could be done. And then when he set out to do, you know, the 14, 8,000 meter peaks, and some of them he did in tandem with a small team, like one other partner. And I thought, wow, this, th that's the way I want to do it. I want to climb without oxygen. I want to push the envelope. I want to go with maybe just one other guy. And, and so, I mean, he set the stage and he was, you know, 10 or 20 years ahead of thinking. Um, and so for me, that was, uh, you know, psychologically, I knew it could be done because he had done it. The hard part was physical, you know, thinking, can I do that as well? Climb to... 29,000 feet without oxygen. And that became my goal um, to train, to focus and, and to teach myself that, you know, it's, it's th this is the only way. If I can't climb to the summit of Everest without oxygen, I'm not going to go to the summit of Everest. And I think if you make that conviction and you dedicate yourself to that, you know, um, you push yourself harder and it, and it takes a huge investment, but in the end, it, it's an amazing reward when you finally take those last steps and you get on the, to the top of the world and you got there without oxygen. And that was for me, a, a literal dream come true. So speaking of that, the values of, I, I know, I think on one of your trips, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was that peace summit. It was that, it was that awareness during after the cold war, but I think they asked you to go up with auction because they didn't want to make any space. But you were, you said you were either going with auction. That you, I mean, you, you've stuck to your convictions, I think is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know, I was invited to go on, on the international peace climb. It was the Soviets and uh, Tibetans, in fact, and Americans. And Jim Whitaker was the leader. And throughout, you know, when I got invited, um, you know, he kind of set the stage and said, listen, here's how it's going to play out. When when the summit team goes to the top, we've got to have two members from each country go to the top together and everybody to ensure uh, success has to use oxygen. And even though I was invited, I said, Jim, listen, um, I've told you before, I'd love to come, but I'm not going to use oxygen. And he said early on, I said, well, we'll discuss that later. And then later become three months later and we're, we're selecting the summit teams. And he said, Ed, I'd like you to be on the first summit team. And I said, well, you know, Jim, I'm not using oxygen. And he says, are you sure? I, I really want you to go on the first summit team. And I said, obviously I can't. So I pulled myself off of that first summit team um, because all of those members had to use oxygen. And then I went, I don't remember four or five days later uh, and on my own literally reached the summit without oxygen. So it, for me, it wasn't important to be first or be on the first team, but I, I, I did, you know, tell Jim early on that that was the way I was going to play it out. What did you said, talked about training, just, I have no idea how you do this, but what were the things that you trained for to plan to do this without oxygen and and when you were climbing you know into these places were there ever times where you're like i think i've really made a mistake here i should have oxygen i should not be doing this right now and maybe didn't i just be interested to know not at all i mean i i i looked at oxygen almost as a cumbersome accessory yeah. something that you had to carry a mechanical device uh, and in essence, something could actually fail, you know, and, and you take the oxygen system away, the regulator and the mask and the tubes and the bottle, you, you, you take it away. And I think simpler is actually better. And I, I've been told many times, you know, climbing without oxygen is, is more dangerous. And I have to argue that 
No, there's so many accidents and incidents that have occurred high on these big mountains where people, you know, their, their regulators fail or they run out of oxygen and then they fail because of that. And I said, if I can remove that system, it's just me and I can tell what's going on. And, and the training part of it was, you know, endurance and strength and running and biking and hiking and also the mental fortitude that I needed to have to just kind of suffer because there is a lot of suffering along as you're climbing to, you know, 7,800 meters, 7,900 meters and above there, you know, you're literally breathing 15 breaths per step and it goes on for hour after hour. So it's kind of that mental barrier that you need to kind of push through as well. But once you do, uh, it's an amazing feeling. Wow. You said earlier about relationships and finding the best climbing partner. I mean, I, I used to be a rock climber, not as much as in my days now, I'm more of a mountain biker, but you know, I always had a, a couple of good partners that I felt very safe with, um, you know, when we were out climbing together and you spoke highly of your relationship with the great Finnish climber, Vika Gustafsson as your kind of perfect partnership. I think it was 10 years that you guys climbed together. And I just, I'd love for you to speak a bit about the partnership and the relationship that is required you know, in these environments, because I'm sure, as you said, there's places and times where where you're suffering and you rely on other people. You and you've talked about even bibbing together and cuddling together and spooning with each other to keep warm and you know packing with less stuff as possible. So just, I'd love to hear more about this partnership that you had with um, with Bika and and how important it was to you. Yeah, um, you know, once I made the decision to do, you know, the fourteen eight thousand meter peaks, I'd done three or four of them. And I thought, okay, who do I want to do this with? And, and obviously keeping a big team together for 10 years or 12 or 15 years, however long it takes, that would have been challenging, you know, six or eight or 10 people. And, and looking back on how Mesner did it with Kama Lander and with Habler, you know, you could do it with two people. And I thought if I could find that right person um, that was doing what I was doing in the same way without oxygen, and also had what I called the same level of acceptable risk. You know, not somebody that wanted to push harder in a, in a risky situation, not somebody that was going to turn around too soon. Um, I thought that would be the perfect partnership. And the first priority I thought is, is first of all, I have to like that person at sea level. Because if I'm not, if I don't like you at sea level, I will not like you at 26,000 feet in a tiny little tent, so good. you know, and you know, the critical, and then also that implicit trust, you know, when you rope up to a partner in the mountains and you know this, when you are connected with that rope, um, you have to trust each other implicitly. And if you don't, you don't rope up. And, and I was introduced to Veka uh, in 1995 by my good friend, Rob Hall, who I'd been working with and he'd guided Veka. And I met Veka and we climbed together on Makalu and, and he was doing what I was doing and I liked him. And I said, Hey, you want to go do this with me? And, and, and he became my brother literally in the mountains. And we climbed together for 10 years, just the two of us going off, having these great adventures. Um, and, and we became so connected. I mean, we could climb all day without saying anything. Um, but literally, you know, with the rope, that's your communicator. And you kind of know by the end what each person is thinking. And if you make a decision or thinking about it, you look at your partner and he's kind of thinking the same thing at the same time. And in the end, that was the, for me, that perfect partnership. Do you guys still spend time together? You know, uh, several years ago, I took my family to Finland and we spent a couple of uh, weeks with Veka. Um, he's not a big communicator, you know, neither am I. So he doesn't like call up and say, Hey, how's it going? Ed? But I could reach out to him in a heartbeat and it, it would be like, you know, we, we, we saw each other yesterday. I mean, we have that connection that we'll never, uh, lose. And, and I still consider him one of my best friends and, and I wish he was my neighbor, but unfortunately he lives way over in Finland. So cool. I'm going to go back to the, your youth, younger days, if you don't mind, because I think characters of how you grew up speak to what you've done and in your book you know and this is what we live and breathe at power to be but you spoke you know about organized sports was not really for you but the love of being outside and was really important to you and how i, I just love to know like what is it that you loved about the outdoors as a young kid and 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 how it's affected you today 
and perhaps how it's had an impact on your own family life with your children. You know, growing up in Illinois, um, I needed, I just had this adventurous spirit. I don't know why. I mean, I was a competitive swimmer. Um, I swam all through junior high, I swam all through high school. That swimming was my life. But I, I, I was always kind of looking for something else, something in the outdoors. And thankfully, I had uh, a stream uh, about a week, uh, about a, a block away from my house with a forest. And I would spend my weekends pretending to be on an adventure. And then books that I started reading took me further on those adventures. And so I eventually realized that, you know, even though I grew up in Illinois, uh, it was not the place that I wanted to, to, to spend the rest of my life. I needed to get away from there and go somewhere and find that outlet. Um, and I, I can't explain it. I mean, you know, why do you somehow fall into a certain thing? You know, you have an adventurous spirit or whatever, but you eventually decide that's your passion. And, and I think it's important when you have a passion to follow that, you know, to go for it instead of saying, eh, that's not normal. I should just stay here and live my life where I am. It's okay to leave and, and step out of the box. And I'm so glad I yeah. did, you know, step out of my, that normal box and go do what I did. And I have zero regrets for doing that. And impact on your kids. Uh, I assume you play a lot of venture stuff with your families. What do you guys do as families? I'm sure they're older now, but love to hear how that's related to your own family life now. Because I think you have four or three kids. I can't remember. I have four kids. And, yeah. you know, Thanks. obviously watching me and always wanting to be outside. I always, you know, and my wife's fairly adventurous. We always like said, we're going outside. We're going to do something. We're going to look for frogs or we're going to have a bonfire. Or we're going to tromp through the woods. And, you know, where we live now and in, in Ketchum, Idaho, there's uh, that's kind of the reason we moved here 11 years ago because of the the Sun Valley Community School. They the, a big part of their curriculum is outdoor programming and awesome. three or four times a year, every grade in the school, they go on some sort of outdoor adventure with their teachers. And my kids have gone whitewater kayaking. They've gone backcountry skiing. They go rock climbing. They dig snow caves. You know, I have a 12 year old, I can give her a packing list and, and an hour later, her, her pack is full and she's ready to go out the door, you know, and it's not something that I uh, pressured my kids to do. It, it's just something that I think they saw that is an amazing thing. And it's so fun to have kids that are just like ready to roll, ready to get dirty, ready to be, you know, uncomfortable um, and embrace that. And, and you don't have to push them to do that. You kind of open the door and you say, this is going to be fun. They might not think it's fun right away. Um, but I have a saying that it doesn't have to be fun to be fun, right? It's, it's all about your totally. attitude. That's so cool. Yeah. My four-year-old, uh, got her starting boulder climbing just wanted, and to your point, just testing it and just watching her thrive on these rocks at a young age and just play and doing her thing. Like it's such a, it's a real treat. And as they grow and we, I'm very fortunate like you to live in a nature space that, to watch them play and grow and, Anyway, I'm from a family of four myself. Um, I think my parents are watching. They're down at Robinson's tonight, um, being a real inspiration to my life. You spoke about your parents in the book and, and what they meant to you. I'd just love to know if you could just speak a bit to growing up, what your parents did and how they, you know, really, I think, taught you about hard work. And I'd love to hear a bit about that. Yeah. You know, I look back and think, you know, why am I, you know, I tend to be not complaining or I'm, I'm okay with being uncomfortable. And I think a, a big part of that was seeing and learning about how my parents uh, endured uh, surviving World War II. My mother uh, grew up in Germany and my father grew up in Latvia. Um, and in the early parts of World War II, my, my father and his family fled Latvia before the Soviets invaded. And then he was put into a, um, you know, literally starving and, and finally getting to a, a German refugee camp and then being supported and sponsored to move here to the U S and my mother, you know, literally surviving bombings in Germany were having to wait to be unburied, you know, and she was, you know, in, in those days, even her father who was in the, in the German army, they weren't advocates of Hitler. They had to, do what they were told and they didn't like what was happening they just had to kind of suffer through it 
And eventually they survived, um, moved here to the U.S., literally started with nothing and built a life. And I look back on, you know, all the opportunities that I had as a kid. I had a house, I had an education, I was comfortable. And I go, wow, my parents started with nothing and look what they provided for me. I have nothing to complain about. And, you know, then I chose to go climbing mountains and I go, I've chosen that. Uh, it is hard. You do suffer, um, but I'm not going to complain about it, you know, because it's something that I chose. It wasn't put on top of me. And I think with that mental attitude, like, you know, you know, being uncomfortable is okay. You know, we're, we've got it pretty good compared to our aunts, you know, our fa fathers and mothers and our grandparents who kind of survived literal hardship. Um, and so I think that gave me a better attitude about just not complaining and just going do what I love and, and saying, this is hard, but it's not that bad. Did they ever worry about you on your climbing missions? Well, my dad kind of really embraced what I was doing. He loved it. And my mom, I think she kind of worried. So I kind of kept it low key. And I, I said, oh, I'm just going to go yeah. hiking or whatever. But I never <laughs> really explained it to her. And I, but my dad kind of, he loved what I did. He followed me, collected all the newspaper articles and magazine articles. And so he was a great fan. That's awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to switch to hockey for a second only because I, it ties into your personal life a bit. Um, well, hockey, you know, in Canada is pretty dear. Um, our women's hockey mm -hmm. team won gold just recently again for another time, incredible story. And, and, and anyway, it's, it's shared among our, all of our generations in Canada and, uh, but I also understand that, you know, kind of there was a hockey event for you that where you met your wife for the first, or your, sorry, partner at the time that became your wife. And I just would like to hear about how hockey introduced you to the woman of your, you know, the person that's been your partner for since then. Yeah. Um, you know, in the early part of my career, uh, uh, even though I had trained to be a veterinarian uh, and I worked, I tried to work as a veterinarian for a few years, but being on expeditions all the time, you know, I wasn't a great employee, so I kind of had to leave my career, believe it or not, as a veterinarian. And I had a really great friend who was a, a building contractor in Seattle, and he he hired me and I became his apprentice and we built houses together. And he was also uh, a big time hockey player. He went to Michigan State and then in, in Seattle, he played in a night league with a bunch of guys, you know, once or twice a week. And they eventually had a 4th of July party in the summer, a bunch of hockey guys. And he said, Ed, come to this hockey party. You know, and I said, no, oh, okay, a bunch of guys again, a bunch of dudes. And But thankfully, there were some girls were there. And uh, one of his buddies that was on the hockey team was dating a woman who had a great friend that she brought. And that's when I met my then future wife, Paula, uh, at a hockey party. I mean, completely random. We weren't climbing or anything. It was just, she was over there, I was over there. And literally for me, it was love at first sight. And after that, we never separated. We've been married, married now 26 years. And she's also, I mean, at one point joined your team a bit too, eventually started sort of on your expeditions too, right? Kind of in ground ops, et cetera, at certain times. Yeah, you know, I took her, you know, just because of what I was doing, I climbed Mount Rainier with her in Seattle and I took her up Mount Baker and, you know, slowly showed her my world. Um, and then in 1995, I worked uh, for the first, for the second time with Rob Hall. Uh, we guided on Everest and, and Paula came along as our assistant base camp manager to Everest. Uh, and then in 1996, um, she came with me again, uh, as our base camp manager, when we made the IMAX film, uh, along with David Brashears. And so, you know, that was like her second trip working, uh, on Everest base camp. Um, and of course that was the year of the, the tragedy. That was the year we made the IMAX film and it was, it was a huge event. And, and I think you mentioned earlier, I mean, for me, probably the, the biggest, hardest, most challenging, um, event of my life. You know, I was the climbing leader of that expedition, the organizer. I worked hand in hand with David Brashears. Um, and then obviously with everything that happened, um, Paula was a big part of that as well. Um, watching it 
play out. And she was the, the, the communicator at base camp as we were up high on the mountain. Um, and to live through something like that, I mean, it's something we'll never forget. Well, you know, I just speak to family again. I mean, your passion obviously is what you follow, and but that passion means you're away from your family a lot, I assume. And and I'm, I mean, I travel for work, and I love the outdoors, and my family is important to me, and I and I have to sometimes leave and be away for time. How did you stay connected? How like that's the, it's hard for me when I'm away from my family, but I also know I need to go do the things that I need to do. And so for you and your world being away for so long, how did you stay connected? to your kids and, and, and your wife during times like that? Because I can only imagine how hard that would be being away for so long at certain times, especially in conditions where you have no communication to any of them, except for maybe a sat phone call at the odd time. Yeah, you know, we kind of figured it out. Um, and believe it or not, you know, I might have been gone on an expedition for three months every spring, uh, even though I had kids. Um, but I was home then literally at home for nine months a year. I worked out of my home, have an office there. And, and I think if you do the math, I was probably home more than most dads, you know, but every spring my kids kind of knew, okay, you know, dad's going to be gone for three months and it, it just became normal for them. Uh, yeah. they didn't quite understand the consequences or the, the enormity or maybe the risk. They just said, oh, dad's going to go climb a mountain and then he'll come home. And, and sure enough, you know, I always came home. And so that became part of the routine. And, and my well, kids, you know, until recently didn't really know the details. And I have older kids now and maybe four or five years ago, my two older kids that finally read my book and they go, God, we never knew you did all that. You know, we just, thought, you know, we, we just kind of kept it low key. Um, but yeah. I truly believe we, my wife and I, we, we scheduled things and we, we integrated what I did with, with me being home a lot. And, and I don't think I missed really a lot. Um, uh, it was just, you know, I was doing what I did and it was part of my job and it was part of what I, my plan and, and my wife accepted that when I knew met her. Um, so there was never any uh, regret or doubt. Uh, I think it worked out pretty well. Yeah, I'll say that's so cool. Um, going back to hockey, last question on the hockey thing. Sorry, hockey fan. Um, how I got to meet you was through hockey. Uh, Mike Gillis, ex past general manager of the Vancouver Canucks, was a friend of mine. And I, and I know he hired you, I believe, to come up and work with the Canucks. And I just, why a Mountaineer with the hockey team? What did you bring to the team and, and what transpired? Like, yeah, what did you do? I just love to hear. And there are some Canuck fans out there that maybe you want to hear from. Personally, I'm a Leaf fan. I hate saying it, but I am. But I, I love to hear how you yeah, helped the team and, and some of the work that they were doing. Yeah. Well, the, the way the connection worked was um, in 2005, uh, I had met through uh, a talk that I had done Todd Lewicki, who at the time was the, the CEO and president of course, Seattle yeah. Seahawks. And, and he, that season, invited me to come at the beginning of the season to talk to the Seahawks. You know, I talked about teamwork and, and, and climbing a mountain. Literally, every game is another step closer to the summit. And I had all these analogies and metaphors. Um, and Todd, even though he was working with the Seahawks, was a big hockey fan. Uh, he'd worked... Uh, at, a, at a point with the Canucks and had knew, known Mike Gillis. And after my season with the Seahawks, and that year, by the way, we went all the way to the Super Bowl for the first time uh, and lost in Detroit. And because of then, uh, through Todd, I met Mike. And in 2010, Mike invited me to come and kind of do the same thing with the Canucks, to come do a talk, at the beginning of the year, talk about all those messages. And then what I got to do was actually hang out with them, to be in the locker room, to go to games with them, just to kind of, wow. and it was so cool. So it was kind of a fly in the wall. I could hang out with the coaches and then I would go in and I'd hang out with the players. And I just, they would accept me as just kind of just hanging out. And that <laughs> year we went to the Stanley Cup. And we went all the way to game seven, as you remember, and lost to Boston uh, in Vancouver on game seven. So I was like this close with the Seahawks. And then I was this close with the Canucks. Um, and then hi uh, Mike hired me for the next two years again 
uh, to work with Canucks because he said the guys love you and they like hanging out with you and your messaging is great. And so that's kind of how it worked out. Well, the Toronto Maple Leafs have the biggest drought, I think, at 1967. So I'm going to talk to general manager. Maybe you can go sit with them in their dressing room and help them get to the Stanley Cup for me. Because if they can get there and I can bring you in, I just hope you hold me up to that deal if I can make that happen. I'll do it. I'll do it, man. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch to back to the mountaineering. Um, some challenges. You spoke to, you know, I think it was your first K2 Summit um, with Scott Fisher. I think it was August 16, 1992. And you, you referred to sort of, I think there was a scenario that you referred to was your biggest mistake and, and a mistake that you learned from that kind of shaped your career today. And I was wondering if you could just speak to that a bit. Yeah, it was, um, you know, the biggest lesson that I learned uh, as a guide uh, even on Mount Rainier and elsewhere was what we call listening to the mountain. And, and I talk about that where, you know, when you're climbing and, and you're high on the mountain and you spend all this time and energy and money and you've got great new fancy equipment and you're close to the summit, that doesn't mean or doesn't guarantee you will get to the top. And what listening to the mountain means is you have to listen to what's going on around you. What are the snow conditions? How late in the day? Is a storm coming? How strong are you? Do you have endurance? You know, what's your rope partner doing? Um, and, you, and you use all that information to make a decision about, do I continue or should I turn around? And, and, I, and I lived by that rule for many years. And then in 1992, I was on K2 with... Scott Fisher and we battled our way up the mountain for two and a half months and finally found ourselves at the high camp and we spent three nights there in a storm. So we, you know, the investment was huge. Uh, and finally the window of weather came, which we thought, and we went and we went when we tried to, and then we went for the summit and it was going to be up about a 10 hour ascent from high camp to the top. And we knew that. And about halfway through that day, storm clouds rolled in and it started to snow i mean voraciously giant snowflakes inches and inches of snow by the minute and i th and i started to think again listen to the mountain what's going to transpire over the next five hours not only as we get to the summit but as we start then working our way down for the next three or four or five hours you know a huge amount of snow is going to be deposited avalanche conditions are going to be tremendous not now but later and i kept telling myself we got to turn around before it's too late and and nobody else was listening to me you know scott was like we got to keep going this is great we're on our way to the top and and so i was kind of alone in my decision making and i, and I thought i should have just said no we got to turn around i should have unroped gone down and turned around at that moment and i knew that um the biggest mistake I was that I made was I didn't listen to my instinct. I kept putting off the decision and I put it off for hour after hour, knowing I was making a giant mistake. We finally, <laughs> yes, we did get to the summit, but I thought, you know, lights out on the way down. I didn't think we were going to survive the descent. And it was, in my opinion, really bad. Um, obviously, we made it down. Uh, I regretted what I did that day. You know, I should not have climbed K2. Um, I didn't say, wow, we got away with it. And I said, that was a, a giant mistake. And from that point on, I said, you know, trust your instinct, listen to it. Uh, no matter what other people are doing or whatever, if the sun is shining, if you feel wrong about a moment, you know, stop and, and evaluate why you feel wrong about it and have a discussion, you know, ask your partners you know, and, and don't feel embarrassed about that. And it's okay mm -hmm. to let other people go on and you turn around. And that was the biggest lesson I learned on that day. It was also a big mistake. Well, it also sounds, I think when you did your first Everest attempt, you took that lesson to heart because I think you had 300 feet or meters, you turned away and went back down. I got to ask you, how hard was that? Because that has got to be really challenging after all of that hard work. Yeah. And that was actually, you know, five years earlier, this was uh, 1987. It was my first attempt wow. or invitation to go to Everest. Uh, I was invited by one of my mentors and teachers on Rainier, Eric Simonson, and he brought me along to Everest. 
And in the end, it was he and I that made the final push uh, to tr try to climb uh, to the summit. We'd climbed a, a, a new route on the, on the north face on the, via the Great Kuar. And 300 feet from the summit, um, things started to go wrong. And the weather was started deteriorating. And, you know, we had this meeting at 28,700 feet. And, you know, we said, well, you know, more than likely we can get to the top no matter what, right? Um, but chances are we won't survive the descent. And, and, and together, unanimously, we said, we've got to stop. We've got to turn around. And, and imagine that you're 300 feet away from the top. And, and I always say, you know, that's what draws people uh, to the summits. You know, it's that, that you're so close and you've invested so much and you're not going to turn around, right? Um, and it's when you really have to pull the stops and say, I've got to listen to the mountain. So that was my first true test, you know, on Everest. And, and five years later, I kind of broke that rule because I didn't listen to the mountain. I didn't listen to my instincts. Someone asked me, there's a message from the crowd here. And it was, um, you know, they saw a photo of the massive lineups at the summit of Mount Everest. And, and they just want to know, is crowding still an issue, you know, these days at the top of, of Everest? Because I know that was part of the tragedy. We don't want to hear to talk about that tonight. But there's just a question from the audience is if you still see that as an issue, um, you know, is that still happening, you know, in Everest and how it's being managed? Oh yeah, it's still an issue. I mean, you're going to see 200, 300 people going to the summit of Everest in one single day. Um, you know, the, the problem is, is, you know, the government of Nepal makes money uh, with tourism and selling permits. And in the early days, when I started going in the late, 80s and the early 90s, the government was very restrictive about selling permits. I mean, you were lucky to get one or two teams on the mountain at the same time. So it was very, you know, wild west, very open. And now it's free for all. You know, you can sell and buy as many permits as you want. And, and there's a lot of guide services out there. There's a lot of aspirants that want to climb Everest. You know, Everest is the highest peak in the world. Um, and you're going to see the crowds. It's going to continue. Um, and it's not up to the government of Nepal to regulate how many people go to the summit on a certain day, right? Mm -hmm. People are now watching when the weather reports and when's that perfect window of opportunity. And rather than saying, you know, why don't we go on day two or three or four or five? Everybody goes on day one because they don't want to miss that one perfect day. And that's why you see gotcha. these giant crowds of people on that very wow. first day. And I know a lot of the older, wiser senior guys, and they just kind of sit back, they let the crowds dissipate, they hold their clients in check, and they say, you know, we're just going to wait. And you, you wait a week or so, and there's another window, and you go to the summit, and there's nobody up there. So, you know, what do you call it? Group think, summit fever. You yeah. don't want to be left behind. Yeah. All those things roll into one. And that's why you see these crowds on that first perfect day. So Everest, I mean, there's all sorts of different sections. What in your mind for you is the hardest section on Everest, the most challenging? Well, you know, it, it, it varies. You know, the, the most, if you're climbing on the south side, the most objectively dangerous part, obviously, is the ice fall. Uh, you have no control of what's going to happen in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it can be the best, smartest climber in the world and something could fall on top of you. Uh, when I've gone through the ice fall and I've been through there dozens of times, I just say, I'm going as fast as I can. I'm going to, I'll see you at the top of the ice fall, but I'm not going to wait for anybody. Um, and you don't need to, you're, you're, there's fixed ropes and, and, um, and then the other part is, I mean, obviously when you're climbing without oxygen, it's the summit day, you know, because you're above 26 and 27,000 feet. Uh, and that's a, a game changer. It becomes exponentially harder when you're that high. And, and with every step you take, you have to remember you're one step further from any sort of rescue or assistant. Um, I mean, if something happens, if you make a mistake, you have to rely on others. And if, no, if there's nobody around, uh, you know, uh, that's a huge uh, consequence. So being very yeah. careful and being very thoughtful. And I think, 
you know what I've learned a lot from the the Sherpa is how to maintain your humility up there because you're not conquering, uh, in my opinion, and and I think in their opinion, you're being allowed to go up, and you have to make sure that. By doing that, you allow yourself enough time and energy also to come down. It's it's got to be a round trip, right? And you've got to plan for coming down. And a lot of people don't do that. They plan for going up, yeah. and they think, "Oh, coming down's easy." And that's when when things start to happen. Yeah, interesting. I'm just paying attention to time, and I can go on for hours. But I'm gonna, you know, when you and I were trying to connect, I love that I. I couldn't reach you because you're in the Antarctic on all these expeditions. Like, okay, fair enough. He can't talk to me right now. I'll give him that excuse for being the Antarctic guy. But I, I, talking about today, you know, doing these different trips that you do from the Antarctic back to Everest in the industry or in the climate that you've seen in the outdoors, what remains the same for you that you like and what has changed that you are concerned about? You know, what I'm concerned about, I guess, is, is the folks that, that go and just want to say they did Everest or something, or say they climbed to the, without enjoying the process, you know, and there's, I, you know, to fault, there's a lot of guide services out there that are shortcutting the process, you know, to okay. saying, we're going to go ahead, we're going to fix the ropes, we're going to carry the loads, we're going to set up the camps, you come in three or four weeks later, and we're going to zip you to the top, right? And people are willing to pay for that. And for me, you know, the enjoyment for me and something that I try to instill with my clients when I was guiding, it, it, it's the process. And, and when you come away from an event, like an expedition, you haven't just gone to the summit of something. You've learned about the process and how to do it. And you've learned something about yourself as well. And that takes time and that takes patience. And, 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 and that makes the trip a little longer and a little harder. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what I'm kind of sad about is the people that don't want to enjoy the moment, right? And now with the internet and the, and the live streaming and with the, you know, the blogging, you know, more people are more concerned about updating their Facebook or their Instagram, you know, rather than just enjoying the view. Um, yeah. That to me is the sad part. Um, the, the cool part for me is I'm still able to go out there and be with people that enjoy the process. And I get to be a part of that and, and I'm still active and I'm still, you know, I got to go to Antarctica, I'm going to Ecuador and I'm still climbing Mount Rainier. Um, and I get to be with people that want to do it and, and take the time to do it. And those are the kind of the people I want to surround myself with. Yeah. Super cool. Now, on that note, you know, I mean, all the places that you've seen and not to get too much in the environment, but, you know, obviously someone who loves the outdoors. Have you seen, you know, as you go back to these locations year after years, you know, it refers to the environment. Have you seen a lot of change, like, you know, from glaciers and more garbage or whatever it might look like? What do you what have you seen over the years and where it exists today? And if, and if it is an issue, what do you think we need to do about it to ensure that we can preserve these places for long, long times? Well, you know, the big question I get all the time is what about the garbage, you know, on Everest? Well, I'd have to say that, you know, the mountain today looks way better than what I saw in in the mid 90s, you know, because we're more proactive. We're more of that leave no trace uh, mindset, you know, take what we bring and take back more than we bring. Um, Obviously, it's a little bit of a tug of war. Some people are more active in that role. Some people still don't care. Um, but Everest and the other mountains, I think they are being well taken care of and, and the attitude is way better than it used to be. Um, you know, as far as, uh, climate change, I believe in it. You know, I've seen, I've done some trips in the Arctic and the, in the Baffin Island region. Uh, and we've spent time with the local Inuit and they're the people that are actually living Right now, climate change. We don't are we, you know, in our cities and our homes down here, we, we're not really mm-hmm. affected by it. But it's the, the people in the northern latitudes where they're hunting and fishing and 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 living in the environment day by day, year by year, they are living the changes and they are seeing the changes. You know, they're the literal canaries in the cold mines. Um, you know, big deal if we go climbing in the Alps and the glaciers and the ice isn't there, you know, we, oh, I can't, I can't climb what I used to, but 
the big effect is the water and the and the glaciers that are providing you know irrigation for for the valleys mm -hmm. and the people down below that's the bigger consequence it's not us you know having to change our climbing technique it's the consequences of the people that are living downstream and that's a big deal in the himalayas as well all the glaciers around everest and the himalaya are feeding the rivers and streams in india and all those countries that are subsisting and and, and growing crops based on the water that is flowing from those glaciers and once those glaciers are gone the water is gone and that's a huge consequence yeah. you know rather yeah. than us worrying about our recreation we have to start thinking about the people that are you know surviving based on the water from the mountains and the water that flows from the mountains thank you um this is kind of a, it's a joint question um we have a bunch of part of tonight was we have a fundraiser coming up called power to summit where we have a variety of teams that will climb their own everest you know not the everest the mountain itself but accumulate the the um the height to achieve their goal and they're going to be doing some fundraising so i'm going to two things that before to ask the question sort of background i remember when you first started raising money you started out selling t-shirts i think with jan spart then you got a sponsor with mtv and ralph loren of all things for mountaineering can't connect the two i know that you lost some funding i think after that and then we're reunited with mount harbor and now rolex so you go from selling t-shirts to rolex so there's a fundraising relationship there so first of all, what's your advice to our participants in this race on, on anything you learn in fundraising that they can learn from to actually, you know, be better fundraisers for this event? And also what would be your advice as they, you know, go and try to, you know, accumulate this as a team, you know, their, their, this hike together and, and, and accomplish Everest in their own way? Well, I guess, you know, when you're going out and seeking, you know, sponsorship or whatever, you know, show your passion. Um, and maybe provide some sort of, you know, what I called return in, of investment. You know, when I went out to seek sponsors, uh, eventually I said, listen, you know, I love your product. I've been using your stuff, you know, be, you give it to me for free, but now I actually want you to start paying me to use your product. But in return, I'll give you something back, you know, something that helps you grow your brand. Um, something that helps you create a better product. And once you create a relationship um, where it's not only feel good, but something where they feel like this is worth the investment. You know, this is something I want to be a part of. Um, this is a person that is passionate about what they're doing. I think if you put all those parts and pieces together, um, that's a big deal. And as long as you can show them you know, this is a worthy cause or this is worth your time and worth your money. Um, they'll jump on board in a heartbeat. And, and, and there's companies and businesses out there looking. I mean, they have people that are looking to spend money to support good causes. You know, that's part of their mandates. Um, and it's consumer driven as well. If they can show that they're part of the community and part of giving, um, that grows their brand and it's a big deal. And, and, and so you just got to approach them and, and show your passion. Cool. And now how about the, the advice on the now as they go out and embark on this race together to achieve their height, any advice, for, even though it's maybe not climbing Iris to the extent that you have, but it's still, you know, hard work that they're going to have to do together. Any advice for our, our climbers as they go embark on this journey in May? You know, it, it's a day by day, right? You, you, you don't, you know, there's been a lot of projects that I was involved with I, where, there, that could have been overwhelmed uh, by the immensity or how long or how hard it would take. And I said, okay, this is going to be long. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be that fun. Um, but if I embrace it and just take it a day at a time, um, that's all it is. Get through today do what I need to do. And then tomorrow I'll do tomorrow. I'm not going to worry about tomorrow the next day. Right. Um, and that way you just kind of nibble away and, and eventually the next thing, you know, you're, you're at the top. Thanks, Ed. Well, you know, it's close to seven. I said, we'd have an hour to commit to your time, to your family. I could go on for hours, but as a result of this, I, I've been truly more inspired and passionate by, you know, everything we've talked about. I, I really am. We are going fishing and I'm, I've got a couple of trips I'm going to send you. We will get away for a few days where I can just immerse myself in your stories. And and uh, I really appreciated your time today. And I'm sure everyone else that listened today, uh, uh, I mean, it can go on and on. But, you know, I mean, I, 
I love mountaineering. I'm not going to say if you ever need another Sherpa, you know, I'm happy to be on a journey with you somewhere. Maybe just Rainier or something small, but I'm happy to come and join you if you'll have me. Um, and, you know, just uh, I wish you all the best and look forward to actually meeting you in person sometime. This has been a real inspirational moment for me. And, and thanks for inspiring our community who's here tonight listening. And uh, I want to thank Mike for, you know, Gillis for making this introduction. It was really kind of him to do so. Um, it meant a lot to me. And Clearly, this was the right decision for us to have this chat. So we're going to be handing out some of your books to some of the recipients down at Robinson's. Uh, I think we're going to wrap one off to someone tonight who is uh, listening here. So we've got your signed books and um, just wish you all the best with your family. Stay healthy and well and uh, look forward to uh, next time. And for anyone else on the room that hasn't signed up for Everest and our Power to Summit and they want to, I would suggest get on our website and sign up tomorrow. Otherwise, thanks, Gail um, and Robinson's for sponsoring. And, and Ed, thank you for your time tonight. And for everyone that listened, we really appreciate it. These are unique opportunities we get to do and sharing stories and listening to people like you that inspire. And uh, and thanks for sharing your passion with us tonight. It was, And I can tell you, I'm, the Leafs are going to be calling you and hiring you to get to the Stanley Cup. That's a promise from me to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. This, is, this has been a lot of fun. All the best to everybody. All right. I'll be in touch, my friend. Take care, buddy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.